leaders in Internet media and the American-made movement. You're listening to Internet Radio America. Coming to you live from the Mendocino Forest in Northern California. Parrots, people, and pets. Your hosts this evening are Michael and Mandolin Cox. We would love to welcome the entire world all the way around the globe to our show. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another glorious night on InternetRadioAmerica.com. Uh, the show is coming to you live from the Mendocino Forest in Northern California. Uh, I'm outside right now, actually, and uh, the sky's beautiful. Got a couple eagles flew by a minute ago. Got a bunch of squirrels, the same squirrels that were here last week, man. They're all lined up in a row waiting for peanuts, you know. No, you can't be on the show, but... I'll mention you. Okay. Anyway, uh, we've got a fantastic show lined up for you tonight. We've got a wonderful, wonderful human being all the way from England who has an owl sanctuary. And this lady is magical. She's absolutely magical. She became a friend of mine on Facebook a few years ago. And I've always been just totally fascinated with what she does with owls and other types of raptors. She's doing what I wish I could do here in some sense, but then again, you know, as you guys know, my wife and I were, were filled with parrots, but her her life and her world is filled with owl. And every kind of owl that you can possibly imagine and raptor this lady has the knowledge of. And we want to share this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful person with you tonight. Before we get started, I want to also mention to you that there's a brand new show coming to Internet Radio America, and it's going to be starting on the 13th of August, Tuesday, and it's going to be aired at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and it's entitled Main Street America, and... Not to give it all away, I'll just give you a small little taste of what this is about. But you guys definitely, definitely need to tune in and please spread the message. We're going to do our best, or this show is going to do its best, to breathe life back into downtown America. To reopen shops, to encourage shoppers, consumers, whatever you want to call yourself. Go back downtown and support the local business that large business has done their utmost to bury. And we're going to bring them back. We're going, to do, we're going to bring them back with your help, with your encouragement, with your support, with your knowledge, and you spreading, taking the time to spread the word. And my brother, Tony Chance, out of Hawaii, is going to be the host of this show. And trust me, he has done his research, and he's going to share with you magical, wonderful things of how you as the individual can breathe life back into downtown America that's losing right now. And uh, once again, Mr. Frank Crumley that owns Internet Radio America, he wants, he's, 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 the, he's the sensei, he's the godfather, in a sense, of wanting to rebirth downtown America. And I think that this show is definitely going to take and make a difference. It's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference with your help and with your support, not to sound redundant. What you as an individual can take and do to support your downtown, to stop your city from changing and be able to bring back certain things that you remember that were special to you and not let it fall by the wayside. So with that in play, Tuesday evenings, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Main Street America, brand new show, awesome, awesome host, not just because he's my brother, but um, he's awesome, okay? And once again, thank you for tuning in to Internet Radio America. Mandolin May Mouse Cox, are you on? Yes, I am here. Then take it away, darling. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. 
we have special guest, Sonia Wright. She was in England, um, I believe Stafford, England, and also the founder of the Owl Experience Bird of Rescue Sanctuary. Um, Andrew Campbell is going to be joining us as well. Um, I believe Sonia works primarily with owls, but I think she also cares for other predator, predatory birds. Um, I saw something on her Facebook not too long ago about having an African gray. I'm not sure if they do anything with parrots or um, perhaps they get birds that people can't care for anymore. Sonia, are you on the line? Do we have a caller with us? All right, well, we'll uh, call her. We'll, hello? Yeah, we'll, we'll get her back. Oh, Okay. All right, well, we're talking on her Facebook not too long ago about having an African gray. I'm not sure if they do anything with parrots or um, perhaps they get birds that people can't care for anymore. Sonia, are you on the line? Uh, hello, yes. Can you hear me? All right, so we're having a little technical difficulty here. Hang in there. Hello? Hello? Okay, so we're having a little te technical difficulty. Just uh, stand by here. Right. I think they're the reason that the spotted owls are so few in population. I read on one website today that there's only 560 pairs of spotted owls in California. And I believe that was the most in any state in the United States. So we're getting down there. And a lot of people believe that the barred owls are responsible because, you know, they're competing for the food and the territory and the habitat and everything. And deforestation is also something um, that's our fault, but... A lot of scientists and environmentalists um, believe that it's not the barred owl's fault, that it's really our fault. Mm. Oh, are you guys on the line? Yes. Oh, hello. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Andrew, are you on the line too? Yes, I'm here. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you both so much for being on our show. We know it's midnight over there where you are. So we wanted you guys to tell us and our listeners a little bit about the rescue and what you guys do there. Well, basically, the, um, the, the sanctuary started about four years ago um, in my back garden. I was probably one of these hypocrites that tells people not to buy owls as pets. But I was insistent on buying one, and one owl turned into be 25 owls, so and and plenty of other hawks. So it's basically, um, yeah, that's how we all started. Is it actually common for people over there to buy owls as pets? Well, there's approximately about 117,000 people in England alone that have owls as pets, and that's not including your hawks and your kestrels and your other kinds of birds of prey. Oh, wow. Okay, because over here in the U.S., you don't hear about people having them as pets. Um, you have to have a special license, I believe, to have any kind of raptor. So what is your daily routine? I mean, when you first get in, um, is it feeding time? Sonia, I think you can go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you just repeat the question, please? How's our daily routine at the sanctuary? Um my daily routine, well, basically, we get there early in the morning, do a security check around the sanctuary, um, check on all the birds. Um, my main role is animal health, and I look after the health and well-being of the owls and hawks. Just keep an eye on Andrew when he's out. So I have to make sure he's doing the right job, which obviously he always does. Um, I'm involved in um, 
rehabilitation, training, playing, a bit of everything really. And how many other people other than you and um, Andrew are there during the day usually? There's just me and Andrew at the moment. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you have to have like any kind of special training before you got to work with these birds? Um, I, I have um, a level two diploma in animal care, but most uh, of what I've learned about owls, raptors is through Andrew or self-taught from hands-on with the birds. And is this like a daily thing for you? Do you go there every day? Uh, every day possible, yes. Okay. Do you guys need any more help, or is, is are you and Andrew really all the help that you guys need? Uh, I think eventually when we expand, we'll, we will be relying on more volunteers. Definitely. Yeah. And so do some of the birds stay at the rescue for their entire lives, you know, ones that can't fly, maybe they've been badly injured, something like that? Uh, yes, we do, we do offer a forever home to any bird that not we can't possibly put back into the wild or right. that's been sadly mistreated. They will stay with us for the rest of our lives. And how many birds do you have now that are going to be there for their whole lives? Um, I think, uh, Andrew, about everyone in the sanctuary at the moment, doesn't it? Oh, okay. So, you guys, do you guys rescue other birds other than owls? Uh, we'll, we'll rescue anything with wings, basically. Do you, I saw um, something on your Facebook a while ago about an African grey. Do you guys, uh, you guys get parrots sometimes? Uh, no, we don't really get parrots in. It's just that uh, sometimes people know, like in my job line, they do ask me for advice and I have to help rehome some for other people sometimes. Yeah, and on average, how many birds would you say that you get in a month? Uh, in a month, um, well, this month we've had nine. Um, but other months it might be one. It all depends, really. Do you ever get birds that people have actually shot out of the air, or is that totally illegal over where you are? Uh, yes, it, it is illegal, but um, at the end of last year we did have a casualty, in, and it was a, a female tawny owl, and she was shot in the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew took it to the vets and uh, she had an operation. She had her eye removed and we kept her at the sanctuary until she was rehabilitated and then she was rehomed to some very caring people who will keep her for the rest of her life. And you guys probably took her to a vet or something or do you do, you do procedures like that at the sanctuary? No, we, we do rely on vets. Uh, uh, we, we aren't qualified to do procedures right. like that ourselves. There's certain aspects of the actual first aid of what we can do with a bird, i.e. splintered broken wings, um, splintered legs, you know, clipping talons, beaks, things like that. But when it comes to, obviously, operations, we have to get uh, vet consultations, yep. Yeah. Right. And so that leads me to my question. Sonia, when you were, you know, your diploma and everything in, in training for working with these birds, what exactly did they teach you to do? How to handle them, how to feed them, all that? Um... On the diploma that I did, we didn't actually touch anything to do with birds of prey, so even with everything I know and I've been written about birds of prey, from Andrew. And how many years, how many years have you, did it take you to get your diploma? Can you just repeat that Hold on, I think we're breaking up. Let me hang up and, and call again. Hold on one second. All right, is that any better? Yes, that's better. Okay, okay. So do you have a favorite owl? Uh, yes, my favorite owl is a uh, Stitch the a great bird. And Andrew, do you have a favorite? I think I'll be a bit biased in saying that I did have a, a favorite Um Unfortunately, any owl species, you know, I can't, I can't say I've got a favourite. No. Do you have a favourite, um, you know, type of hawk or anything? Um, I personally have. I do have a favourite, the Lana falcon or the Perisaker. 
um, which normally commonly used as hunting birds, but obviously we we don't we don't hunt our birds because when when they actually do come to us, I personally believe it's a retirement home for them. You know what I mean? Because obviously some of the cruelty cases that have come into us, you know, we just basically give them home for the rest of the days, and we you know I'm hopeful they enjoy it. Right. Well, I have to say my very favorite is a kestrel. <laughs> Those things are so cute. So now you have a picture of of a couple, I think, different ones on your Facebook. What's their story? Well, basically, um, what we try and do is we try and um, when we when we, when we, the centre finally does open in the next couple of months, it's more it's going to be more of an education centre. So we try to get different birds in, and we went out and we got a kestrel. Um, Sky, her name is, Hi. and she's about she's about twenty weeks old, and she's an absolute little cracker, flying <laughs> already. Um, and she's 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 happy, but what we're trying to do is try to get different birds in. So when people come in, they can see what exactly what beauty we do have in this country. Because I think a lot of people are naive these days to what we actually have. Right. And you guys are going to be open to the public soon. Are you doing that for educational reasons? Or are you also doing it for, you know, to help finance your sanctuary? I um, I personally, well, there will be a, a maybe a small admission fee, but it'll be a minimal cost. But every single thing that comes into the sanctuary will go towards, um, uh, like, vets fees, you know, maintenance of the aviaries, food more in particular, and medicine. Right. And so you guys do charity events sometimes to raise finances, right? We, uh, we, we started doing a lot of charities when we first started the rescue, so obviously to get our name about... Um, there was basically a method behind my madness, really. If I did a lot of charity work, my name was getting about as well. So it would be, it'd be like, um, I would say robbing Peter to pay Paul, but, you know, we, we thought that would be the best way of us, um, you know, getting our name about by doing charity work. And we've done quite a lot now and raised quite a considerable amount of money for different charities. Yeah, that's great. That's a, that was a good idea. And I actually, there was a section on your website with um, some wedding pictures with some owls. You guys... Is that a common thing that you guys do? Well, we, we're trying to train up um, our favourite little girl, Molly. Um, she's very, very famous in Staffordshire. Everywhere we go, people say, oh, how's Molly? How's Molly? And, and um, we're basically trying to train her up to fly wedding rings um, down the aisle to the bride. <laughs> no. So hopefully that will... Re- Again, we're not... It's going to be, you know, obviously to... Uh, you know, because... When we when we do the weddings, there'll be a donation made to the sanctuary, which again generates money for the sanctuary again. Right. Do they usually have the, their weddings on your premises, or do you guys go to them? We normally go to them. Um, you know, we unfortunately we don't have the facilities at the sanctuary to host anything like that. Um, but you know, once we, we you know once we once we get on and the sanctuary grows, you know, I'm sure that you know. Wouldn't you like to get married in the middle of a, a field with birds of prey flying around you? Right. I'd do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, in fact, Andrew, we actually um, we we live in the Mendocino Forest in Northern California, and we have many many birds of prey here. We have uh, we have screech owls, we have barn owls, we have bald eagles, a tail hawks. Um, you know, we're, you know, but I just wanted to interject real, real quick to you, Andrew, and to Sonia, that I think that what you guys are doing is absolutely beautiful, and, and, and thank you, thank you from the heart for being on the planet and taking the time to take and do something for these beautiful, beautiful spirits in our clothing, if you will, uh, let me ask you this real quick. Um, how um, I know we have parrots, okay? We have big macaws and African greys and things like that, and they are, are very, very affectionate. Do you find a, a similar affection, basically, with these owls? In other words, I've seen pictures, Sonia, okay, of you holding these beautiful owls and things of that nature with you, um, but do they, do they offer back to you? The, the the affection. Do you do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Do they? Yes, I definitely think that they do. I think they uh, give you as much as you give to them. 
I think you know, you know, with uh, with 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 an answer to your question on my views, and I think personally, well, we basically got two kinds of birds. You have got parent rear birds, and you have got crash rear birds. And crash rear birds are basically taken away from the parent after three weeks, and, they, and the first thing they see when they open the eyes is a human. So the first thing they see basically is mother, whether as the, the, the parent rear is kept with the with their mother and father. So it's the same with 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 owls as it is with with other types of birds. Um, when they're they're removed from the family, so they and they open their eyes. Leaders in internet media and the American Made Movement. You're listening to Internet Radio America. Rowdy Bush Incorporated, premium bird food for your valuable pet. Formulated by renowned avian nutritionist Tom Rowdy Bush. Rowdy Bush bird foods are fed to pet birds worldwide when high quality diet is a must. All of our food is 100% edible, contains no added sugar, animal byproducts, artificial colors, or flavors. Please visit www.roudybush.com or call 1-800-326-1726 to place your order today. Attention all animal lovers. This is Cynthia Gary, the inventor of Scratch and All. We know all animals love to scratch. Scratch and All is a safe, unique, American-made animal enrichment product that can be mounted flat on a wall or bent over corners. All four sides interlock so you can design a grid tailored specifically to your animal's needs and it can be a supplement to acupressure. Go to scratchandall.com and take advantage of the celebration bundle. Nearly 11,000 sold. That's the word scratch. The letter N as in Nancy, A L L dot com, or call 1 888 9 Scratch. Need therapy but can't afford to sit on the couch or a therapist's office for answers? Tune in to Global Therapy, the most therapeutic show on the planet. Heal your heart and mind by listening to others and sharing your own issues. So many people in the world today suffer with emotional problems that can be solved without having to spend a fortune. Begin to live a better life and see the world in a brighter light. Hosted by Michael Cox of the Global Nest Exotic Bird Sanctuary. Every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right after Parrots, People, and Pets on InternetRadioAmerica.com. Leaders in Internet Media and the American Made Movement. You're listening to Internet Radio America. Hi guys, welcome back to the show. We're Hello. talking to Sonia Wright and we're talking to Andrew Campbell, the founder of the Owl Experience Bird of Prey Rescue Sanctuary. And you guys are in Stafford, England, right? Yeah, right in the center of England. All right. And so it is around midnight over there, correct? It's um, yeah, it's about half past twelve in the mor- in the morning. Yes. All right. Well, I want to tell the, the listeners um, about ways that perhaps they could donate to your cause. You do got you guys do have a website. It is um, theowlexperience.net, and it, there is a donation page on that website, correct? There is, yeah, but if, if, if anybody would like to donate, just, just send us an email and something, or, you know, we can give them a call and we can, we can discuss that, you know, and if anybody wants to adopt a bird, you know, just give us a shout, same as, just, just give us a call or send us an email. Andrew, or excuse me, Andrew, w- once again, what is the title of your website? The title of our, our website is The Owl Experience Stafford, and it's www.theowlexperience.net. And you guys also have a Facebook page, which is, you can look up facebook.com slash theowlexperience, all one word. And um, sometimes they post that date and they, they show pictures of the owls they get in and the owls are taking care of. It's really neat to see. I mean, especially for people like like us in the U.S. who, you know, we definitely don't see owls as pets. And, you know, you see them sometimes 
in a zoo or something, but they're pretty they're a pretty rare sight. We see some in the forest every once in a while, but it's it must be quite an experience to work with these guys. I'm sure they're a lot heavier and um a lot different temperament than parrots, obviously, but um do you guys have to maintain them kind of like we do our parrots? I mean, you have to um you know, trim their beak and trim their nails every once in a while. I imagine that you'd probably have to. Well, I don't know if you would have to trim an owl's nails. Do you have to? Because, or do they naturally just kind of trim themselves? Well, basically, what we have to do is every three months we have what's called a coping day, uh, and what we do then is we go in, check all the owls to make sure the talons are not too long or their beaks are not too long, because obviously if, you're, if an owl's beak is too long, the upper mandible gets too long, that it can actually get stuck in the meat, and it can be very, very hard for the owl to eat. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, the same thing with parrots, too. You can't let them get too long, or they have difficulty eating. Andrew, what do you feed your owls? We uh, we try and vary their diets. Um, obviously, they are all raptors, which are you know obviously meat eating birds. Um, so we have to vary their diet from um, as a rats, mice, um, day old chickens. Um, but we also supplement them with what's called SA thirty seven, which I'm probably sure you've heard of. Okay, I had I I had a at one time at our sanctuary, we had oh, a, uh, bring a. Uh, Baby screech owl by him. You're familiar with what a screech owl is, right? I believe you have an eastern screech owl and a western screech owl, am I right? Well, I'm in the west, so I would imagine it was probably a western screech owl. It was a little baby that had come out of a nest, and some friends of ours brought it over here. It was covered in ants. And I got all the ants off of it and talked to uh, a friend of mine that has a raptor sanctuary not far from us. And what we basically gave the owl was uh, chicken thighs and chicken legs raw to help build protein and things of that nature with the owl. To make a long story short, I named him Archimedes. <laughs> and it's wow. just a, I mean, I, I wanted to get so close to him. I mean, he'd hop up on me. I would snuggle him. And then all of a sudden I realized, Michael, you're doing the wrong thing here. You need to back off because this guy one day needs to go out and learn to hunt himself and not depend on us. And he was released, and as far as I know now, he's, he's doing super. But that is, that it was my only first time ever owl experience. I mean, he was just precious. And that's why I was asking you earlier on the show in reference to when you hold them, if they, if they, if they bond to you because... This little baby owl, like you were saying earlier, Andrew, when they open their eyes, well, obviously his eyes were already open and he was going through living hell being covered in ants. But we saved him, and I know that he thought that I was dad. And the hardest thing in the world for me, my man, was that one day that I said, okay, it's time for you to take and fly free and all. But for people that, like myself, that come upon these beautiful, beautiful creatures, uh, what do you think that they should feed them to get them prepared and get them ready for the wild? If they're not as experienced as you are, but what they can get on hand or whatever, was I doing the right thing? You were, um, <clears throat> excuse me, normally we wouldn't, um, yeah, I'm not saying you, you've done the wrong thing. I think you've, what you've done is actually wonderful. Uh, you know, you did what you thought was right. But what a lot of people now is, a lot of people, unfortunately, I have to say, are very naive towards birds of prey. And a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people now think they still eat nuts and they still eat like fat balls and things, which in fact is actually deadly poison to them. Um, so what I could suggest is maybe just go to your pet shop and maybe buy a couple of frozen mice or something like that. You know. Um, actually just feed it whole don't, obviously you don't need to cut it up because obviously the birds will be, um, be wild birds anyway so they'll be naturally um, you know, naturally be able to do it but I would say probably if not if you want to go to the, the cheaper route um, you would say day old chickens or you know, some kind of day old quail or something like that okay, okay All right, yeah, being that we live in the Mendocino Forest we don't really have a lot of access to I mean, we live in the middle of nowhere, Andrew, okay? I mean, literally 12 million acres in the Mendocino Forest. Wow. Uh, 
when we walk <laughs> outside and it's a full moon, my man, it's like you can put your arms around it and bring it to your chest. So I was told, as I said earlier, you know, I was told that chicken thighs, raw chicken thighs and legs with the cartilage and all of that would help build the protein and stuff. So if someone doesn't have access to be able to, say, go and get the frozen mice, all right, and things of that nature, is that an, is that an, uh, a, a good substitute to be able to use in the meantime? Because there's a lot yeah. of people out in the country that don't have that kind of access, sir. Yeah, it wouldn't do any harm feeding them, um, you know, raw chicken. Um, uh, and then again, a bit of steak here, there, if they're feeling a bit flush. Um, but, you know, a bit of steak, a bit of chicken, yeah, that should be absolutely fine. Um, and then, obviously, once you can get to uh, get to a pet store or something like that, you know, and, uh, you know, you could um, go that route as well, yeah. Okay, super, because, I mean, this little guy grew like a bandit. I've got him on my Facebook page, got a little hat on him, you know. I didn't put it on in my Photoshop. Okay, I give it up. All right, I Photoshop the hat on the owl. All right, but uh, you know, but he he grew up. You know, he was healthy and stuff, and he's off. Probably, hopefully, has a family of his own by now. And all. And uh, once again, I want to reiterate to you people that are listening, um, Andrew and Sonia, what they're doing is they're creating something and allowing you to realize that they're doing something from the heart. And I really wish there was a lot more of us on the planet that took the time to do this because when I was talking with my brother earlier in the week, that in the beginning, the owls, the birds of prey, the things that swim in the sea were here long before we were. And we are their guests. And for what you are doing, Andrew, and what you are doing, Sonia, I more than applaud and thank you, and I welcome you. I welcome both of you to come one day and visit our sanctuary. We have a different kind of winged warrior, okay, in our home. But the ones that have wings and ones that fill our forests and our skies, you know, have something to say. And before I close here and give this, give this back to Mandy, I asked you something earlier, and I guess you may have mentioned it, but I missed it. When you hold an owl, an owl, say, that you know is going to be with you forever because something has happened to it, you know, physically or emotionally or whatever, but you know it's going to be there forever. When you hold them in your arms and you bring them to your chest, do you feel their love? Do you feel that delicious connection? I think Sonia would agree with me here that, you know, you build up a bond with the owls. You know, you've, you know, when some of the cases that have come in that have been, you know, very, very severe, where there's, there was a seven, there was a, maybe an 80, 20 percent chance of survival. And we've actually kept them alive and release them. You know, you've, you've seen them from near death right the way to when they're going to go back to the wild. And sometimes it can be, you know, up to eight to 10 to 12 months before, you know, before the rehabilitation process is finished. And you do build up a, um, like a, a relationship with them, and it's sad to see them go. It really is. It's the same, then, isn't it? That's what I'm trying to get across to you, folks, is that owls, all types of raptors, eagles, hawks, all of these guys, they all house one unique common thing of reference, is that they are self-aware, and if they trust you and they believe in you, they're going to show you their affection. That's absolutely beautiful. Mandolin, go ahead. And I wanted to, you've, Michael was kind of asking you about what you've fed these guys. You guys feed them um, live rats and mice, do you? No, we don't. We, uh, we buy them specially pre-packed frozen. Um, in fact, I'm actually a lover of mice as well, so I couldn't actually do that even if I had to. <laughs> okay. So I kind of wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about um, the petitions that are going around. I know it's, it happens in, it's happening in Oregon and in British Columbia right now. I don't know if you guys have the same kind of issues um, with people that are wanting to um, shoot a bunch of barred owls because they believe they're the reason there's so few spotted owls. Do you guys have that problem over there? Well, again, um, Sonia, are you still there? Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, you're very quiet. <laughs> um, I think, uh, like, again, Sonia would agree that, you know, 
it is a very very strict um uh, regime over here with, with regarding um you know the the the, cu- the culling of owls and things like that it just doesn't happen here you know our owl population has dwindled by about 70 percent wow. now in the whole in the whole of staffordshire where we live and Sonia will tell you here that there are only a maximum of about 20 breeding pairs of barn owls left. You know what I mean? Is that, not... is that due to deforestation over where you are? It's through, it's through, it's through general um, human persecution. You know, lack of habitats, you know, um, poisons being put on farmlands. You know, you, what, they, what the farmers don't seem to realize is, is that, they, you know, it trans, the, the poison's transferred over to the mice. The, the owls eat the mice and it kills the owls, you know. It's oh, okay. a vicious circle. Do you guys... Well, hold on a minute. Andrew, I just heard what you said, and it, 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 it was like a screaming jet that went through right through my heart, my friend. So the farmers are, in a sense responsible for the depopulation of many types of owls because they eat food that is poison because they want to keep the rats out of their corn garden, but they don't have a clue. So let me ask you this. Do I would you... say it's a minority of farmers, not every farmer. We, you know, we've come across farmers in the past, haven't we, Sonia, um, where they've welcomed, you know, the barn owls and the tawny owls and the, and the eagle owls, whether it's the minority of farmer that have, farmers that have turned around and said, look, I don't want any of these on my land. Okay, so let me ask you this. What would be, for the farmer that is doing this, okay, and probably for the most of them, they may not even know until maybe possibly they're listening to the show right now, that what they're doing they're taking well, care of one problem, but they're creating a bigger problem. Do you well, the see, way I see it, yeah, the way what I see it, they can do differently? Well, if the way I see it is, you know, bal- nature will balance out itself, you know. Um, you know, it's like you were saying about the barred owls over there in the States being cold. You know, they, they, you know it's, 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 I'm just sort of reiterating what you said. You know, these birds have been here for millions of years. The first raptors were the pterodons and the pterodactyls. You know, Absolutely. so basically, they stem from these birds. We are the visitors here, and we are, the per- we are, we are persecuting the birds, and that is the reason why we're the dilapidated in numbers. So the human being is to blame. Okay, Andrew, let me ask you this real quick, my friend. Do you think, like with, with Mandela and my wife mentioned, regarding the certain types of owls that are responsible for taking down or degrading other types of owl families, do owls do, actually do this? In other words, does one kind of owl decide, okay, you know what? I'm going to take you down because you're not the same kind of species as I am and will actually avidly go out and want to take a whole community uh, or species of owl down because of that. Does that truly happen, or is this just media hype that you're giving us? Well, it doesn't happen here. Let's put it that way. Um, there was a there was a um, a thing passed in government here um, about the culling of the um, the buzzards. I think it lasted about five minutes. Um, but, you know, that got overturned straight away. But, you know, I think that, you know, the culling of, of owls in, in any country, regardless of what, is absolutely outrageous. You know, leave nature to itself and it will balance itself out. Well, yes, nature itself will balance itself out. But, however, the integer here, my friend, is that when man all of a sudden intervenes, and when I'm trying to get across to you so that I've got something to put in my shotgun when I go after these people... Uh, hypothetically speaking, that they're saying one species of owl is on a mission to destroy another species of owl. The owls that you have there with you, they cohabitate, right? Yes, they do, yes. Live together. Do you find any particular aggression from one owl to the other, from one type of species of owl to the other? Is there aggression? Is there this feeling of like, you know what, I just somehow, I can't tell you why, but I don't like you and I want to hurt you? Um, no. 
you will get um, obviously owls are very very territorial, and if in an owl flew into a you know into um, into their area or uh, you know it flew into their area, yes, they would chase it back out. But you know that would be a last resort. You know what I mean? You know they'd rather go after something else that's a bit more you know easy to um, to kill basically. Okay, so what you're telling me basically is really, really good, good information, and I thank you, because obviously the information in the media that we're being fed is that one species of owl, owl somehow doesn't feel comfortable about having another species of owl around it, and it's responsible for the depopulation. Leaders in Internet media and the American-made movement. You're listening to Internet Radio America. Need therapy but can't afford to sit on the couch of a therapist's office for answers? Tune in to Global Therapy, the most therapeutic show on the planet. Heal your heart and mind by listening to others and sharing your own issues. So many people in the world today suffer with emotional problems that can be solved without having to spend a fortune. Begin to live a better life and see the world in a brighter light. Hosted by Michael Cox of the Global Nest Exotic Bird Sanctuary. Every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right after Parrots, People, and Pets on InternetRadioAmerica.com. Wednesday night on Internet Radio America. It's American made, baby. Hi, I'm your host, Frank Rowdy Crumley. Liz Havlin and I host American Made. We talk to manufacturers. We talk to consumers. And we bring them together. It's American Made on Internet Radio America. Wednesday, 7 o'clock Eastern. Tuesday on Internet Radio America. It's Beans and Apples. Saxon Rowdy in the house to talk about New York and Boston. It's the sports. It's the culture. It's the fans. Beans and Apples, a special sports talk show between New York and Boston. 8 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday nights on Internet Radio America. Leaders in Internet media and the American-made movement. You're listening to Internet Radio America. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I believe we have a caller on the line. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, this is Adrian Crowther from Shine Out Brightly. Oh, hi, Adrian. You are our other guest. We want right. to thank um, Sonia, and we want to thank Andrew for being with us on the show tonight, talking with us about their Owl Rescue Sanctuary. Their website, again, is www.theowlexperience.net. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, you guys. Uh, hold on, hold on just, just a second. Um, we're going to, Andrew and Sonia, there's a, 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 one more question I want to ask you before you go. Are you still there? Yeah. Yes, still here. All right. Uh, you bring these owls into your sanctuary, the ones that you know that you are going to keep forever. They can't once again be released. In what what is what from your heart basically do you feel when you hold these birds, knowing that they can no longer be released into the wild? What kind of emotional and physical exchange you share with these beautiful creatures to let them know that they've got a forever home? I don't... <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think it's a case of showing them any special favors, but as long as we can we can keep them in a clean environment, you know, we can feed them. You know, obviously, if it can't feed for itself, you know, it will never have to work again. Um, but, you know, we'll give it as much love as, as it would be if it was out in the wild, you know? We... we um, we have no preferences on, you know, what, you know, what we do with the, um, you know, with the, the love, sorry, the love of the owls is, is probably more important than anything, you know, give them respect and they'll give you respect back. Absolutely fantastic. Andrew and Sonia, we definitely, definitely 
because we've got another guest on. Uh, but we definitely want you back because I've got a gazillion more questions and a lot of people <laughs> are, are contacting me on Facebook and email right now and have a million questions. And would you folks please honor us by returning to one of our shows in the future? Yes, definitely. Absolutely fantastic. Bless both of your hearts for what you do, these beautiful, beautiful creatures. And as I said, I've only had one owl. Okay, that I've gotten to hold and got to feed and got to release into the wild. And what you guys are doing, I think, is absolutely fantastic. And someday, if we, Mandolin and I, can actually find a babysitter, we would love to fly over and visit your sanctuary and meet you personally. And once again, I'm going to reiterate, you are welcome to visit our sanctuary any time. And thank you so very, very much for being on the planet and having the beautiful heart that you have. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, so on the line with us now, we have special guest, Adrian Crowther. Thank you for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And you are the founder of Shine On Brightly, which is a company that creates unique memorials that are handcrafted. You guys make cremation urns, memorial and cremation jewelry, memorial paintings and glass. And you guys, I think what our listeners would be especially interested in is you guys specialize in pet memorials. You have urns specifically tailored for dogs. There's one shaped like a doghouse that I saw, and others Mm -hmm. shaped like dogs and cats, which I saw on your website. Mm -hmm. Um, You guys are located in North Carolina, and everything is handcrafted in the United States. Right. Correct. So how did your company start out? Well, I've always had um, a passion for art and um, just the expression, the human expression that can come through art and the handmade object. And um, I just thought that it was a perfect way to memorialize people and animals, is it, you know, through something that was handmade by a person rather than a lot of these outsourced and mass-produced products that are prevalent on, online today. So I had um, worked in the arts throughout my whole career. I'd, I had been I'd been involved in um, performing arts, but I'd been an arts administrator, and I I was actually the director of the arts council here in Asheville, North Carolina, for a while. And so I knew how to rally artists, and we have a lot of great artists in this area. So um, I formed the website of the company ShineOnBrightly.com in 2008, and then. About 15 months later, I experienced a series of profound losses. My husband died, and then my sister-in-law died, and then my mom died. So, and I was sort of on the in the position of my customers, where I thought, "Wow, you know, now I know what it's like to be um, having be, being in grief. If you're kind of stunned, whether it's a person or a pet that you've lost, it, it's just very um, let's see, earth-shattering time. And Absolutely. Yeah, and so, you know, when you look around and how to memorialize this person or or pet, um, I'm gonna, I guess I'll focus on pets for the sake of this. Pets um, really are people trapped. <laughs> right, 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 I know. Um, once, I want to reiterate, oh, you are fully an American-made company. Absolutely. You produce absolutely. Everything, everything that's produced for you, and what you create is done right in America. Am I correct? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I get contacted by artists overseas all the time, but I, I really am strict about that made in the U.S. part of my business. Oh, fantastic. You're also on Four Days for America. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Four Days yep. for America is another awesome, awesome show on internetradioamerica.com that you folks mm-hmm. definitely should tune in to. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's our way of sharing with you that we need to remember our own backyard and mm-hmm. support our own family business and our product, blood, sweat, and tears that we put into everything that we do, bringing exactly. it home. And, and Adrian, I applaud you for for your for convictions in this. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, Thank you. I'll your heart, mandolin. So, Adrian, I, I wonder, do you, um, if you had an experience such traumatic loss. Do you think this company would have ever gotten started? Um, well, I would say yes, 
I, I did start it just before I experienced all these losses because of I had this passion for art. But once I experienced, I really went through these losses. I it was it became like a vocation for me because I saw what the options were for people who are going through this, and you don't have a lot of time. You're kind of in shock. You don't know. You, you know. The op- you don't know where to turn, basically. So I started the company, and I, I felt like, well, this is, this is what people really need, and this is what people want to find. They want something personal. They want something that captures the spirit of their pet. And there's not a whole lot out there because there's so much mass-produced stuff out there. So, um, And, you know, I also think it's important to create work for artists um, because I, I think that's sort of an area that's undervalued in our society. So... So those are sort of where my thinking um, came from, you know, to start the company and and to develop the company. And so, I mean, I have people who um, commission art pieces for their pets. I had a woman who had a Pomeranian who um, passed, and she really liked this one artist on my website, so she said, how can I connect with that artist to... um, make something special for my dog. And so I connected the two. I connected the artist with that person, and they talked about the dog, and, and they she got to show pictures of the dog to the artist and tell her stories. And so in that way, it becomes a healing process as well um, because, you know, we all need to talk about our, our loved ones when, when we lose them. And they came out with, like, this amazing piece that really, it, it, she felt, captured the spirit of her pet. So... You know what, Adrian, that's absolutely beautiful. Uh, That's one of the things that we do here at our sanctuary is that I paint my dreams, and I've had a number of people all over the world that have sent me pictures of their pets and animals that I put into my three-dimensional backgrounds, give them a forever home, if you will, in their mind. And at first, you know, to be honest with you, so you know, uh, urns, things of that nature for pets and stuff. I was going like, oh, you know, I'm not really sure about this. Right. But as I listen to you talk, one of the things that, folks, I want you to listen up right now. Those of you that have birds, okay, that have pets right now that are living, all right. People that are not, a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends all over the world have had birds that they passed away. They've gone through the process of necropsy of, you know, taking them apart, trying to figure out what in the world happened to them and all of it. And the bird ends up going into a dumpster. And I think, Adrian, I think that the service that you're offering is awesome and that more people need to know of this, that they can have, they can have their, their beautiful, beautiful pet, beautiful mm-hmm. confidant, the one that has shared their heart for years and years and years, and and acknowledge them and give them a place of remembrance. I guess I got to give it up to you, Adrian. Okay, mm-hmm. I applaud what you do. I, to be honest with you, at first I'm going like this is kind of like, but then <laughs> I think about it. You know, I luckily I in the 50 years that I've worked with birds, I've never lost one yet. But if I did, folks, if I did. I would probably contact Adrian and go, you know what? My bird's not going to end up in a garbage bag in a dumpster after figuring out what killed it. I'm going to honor this bird the way we do human beings when they pass. We give them a gravestone. We give them mention. We have people show up that share their hearts and feelings of missing them and things of that nature. And I think that pets deserve the same kind of ritual, delicious Mm -hmm. ritual, if you will. And bless your heart, Adrian. I love you, baby. <laughs> what you doing is really you. awesome. And you know, and and, and I did have a person like um, when I moved to North Carolina. I used to live in um, Rhode Island for a long time. And when I moved down here, right before I moved, my I had this beloved German Shepherd. I mean, this the, he was such a member of our family. I, I, um, we got him when I was pregnant with my first child, and he. You know, he really, like, cared for my kids. He was amazing. And right before we moved down here, he um, had to be put down. He he had a lot of health challenges, and he was in a lot of pain. And there was no way I was going to leave him up there. So 
I brought him down on the trip down to North Carolina, and he's sitting in one of my urns in my in my library right now. And you know, so so that kind of thing I think happens a lot, where people are very transient now and move around a lot, and they just want to keep their animals with them. So let um, me ask you this, uh, and I'm I'm and you know I'm probably I'm probably going to ask you a question that probably a lot of people right now have on their minds. Mm-hmm. When you look at this urn, okay. Mm-hmm. When you look at the urn, you pick this urn up. How does it? How does it truly make you feel? The pet, okay, the pet is gone. All right, in one sense. All right. 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 But yet, the pet isn't. But how does it truly make you feel, Adrian, when you know that the essence of its physical being mm-hmm. is now in this urn that's with you? It's with you for life. What does it? really, truly do for your heart. That's what you need to get across to people. Right. And I, 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 it just, I feel like he came with us on this journey and he's still with us and he, um, he's just part of our family and I'll, you know, he has to have a place in our home no matter where we live. And, and so he is forever with us because he was such an important part of our family. So it's a way of keeping keeping this beautiful, beautiful, delicious being, this spirit, right, or in your heart on a constant, mm-hmm. as opposed to people that, you know, some we, you know, we all lose things, okay. And time, you know, time is time is the bandit. Time mm-hmm. is. I've always believed that time is something that man invented and then became its worst enemy. Um, so what you're doing then. And correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Because mm-hmm. believe me, I've been wrong so many times. That's why I have so many freckles. Every freckle on my means every time I look at one of them, I go, "You made the wrong choice." <laughs> but the idea of having of having your pet with you, in a sense, all right, mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. a sense, does it make it easier? Does it make it easier on your heart of doing it this way as? A, eventually letting the memory fade and the sorrow basically fade to the point where, you know, do you feel like you're doing the right thing, Adrian? Absolutely, absolutely. And whenever I look at this piece, this urn that's in my library, I just think, oh, he's right there with us. He's right there with us. You know, and um, and I actually I have a, an older dog right now, and I'm kind of facing, I'm coming up to facing that choice, which is such a tough one because, you, you know, you just hate to do it and you don't want to make your dog suffer. But I, I, do, I do know that eventually when this dog, um, when his end comes near, I'm, I, I'm totally going to, you know, honor his energy and honor his presence and his, his time with our family and keep him around and have this memory of him so that I can look at this piece and say, he's right here with us. He's always with us. And, and that's, I think, really important. I think it helps us. Um, I, you know, I think that it's absolutely fantastically important. As I said to you earlier, you know, at first the concept of all of this, I'm going like, you know, well, wait a minute. No, but I can't, you know, I, I, I've gone 180 degrees from when I talked to you on the phone, all right? <laughs> I, I truly have. At first, I thought, you know what, this is like, this is just wrong, all right? <laughs> this is just wrong. I'm being honest with you, okay? Uh-huh. But I'm also being honest with you enough to let you know that from what you've communicated tonight and what you've said, do you realize we're broadcasting to over 190 countries? That oh, wow. What you've Tonight, all right, to all you folks out there, we're parrot people, okay? That's just who we are. Mm -hmm. So you guys have to face the time of letting your parrot, of saying goodbye to your parrot. You don't necessarily have to say goodbye to it. Right. Right. You know, in a sense of knowing that the vet checked it out, told you what went down, whatever, and you never get to see any of your bird again. That the respect of the individual, the respect of the life form, of Uh bringing that home, of bringing that home. Because you know what that does, folks? 
the one thing that it does, the one beautiful, delicious thing that it does, is that it keeps you from ever forgetting. Thank you for being on our show, Adrian. We really appreciate you being with us. Thank you, for, thank you so much for having me. Her website. Let me have you back, darling, because I got a whole lot of more questions for you, positive okay. ones. And once again, thank you for tuning in to Pets, Pets, and Pets. Thanks for what you're doing. Need therapy but can't afford to sit on the couch or a therapist's office for answers? Tune in to Global Therapy, the most therapeutic show on the planet. Heal your heart and mind by listening to others and sharing your own issues. So many people in the world today suffer with emotional problems that can be solved without having to spend a fortune. Begin to live a better life and see the world in a brighter light. Hosted by Michael Cox of the Global Nest Exotic Bird Sanctuary. Every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right after Parrots, People, and Pets on 